Okay, good morning. <laughs> welcome. I mean, like, if you're first time here, welcome to Faculty of Agriculture, Department of Crop Science. Hi. How are you feeling? Good. Yeah. Anybody fasting? <laughs> no, if you want to fast, it should be uh, yesterday. Right. So, thank you for coming. Actually, this is the first um, such session conducted in our department. Okay, but it's not my first session delivering uh, lecture and demonstration pertaining to photosynthesis. Okay, so I, I think most of you know that uh, I got channel that I uploaded all my lectures there. Okay, uh, uh, video pelik pelik itu pejamata je. Uh, just focus on the lectures. All right. <coughs> so we I'll just quick recap what's going to happen. Uh, do you have this? The tentative. It should be in your um, uh, lesson kit. Right. So we got three days. So the first day. Purely, we're going to involve, um, refresh the review about photosynthesis. Actually, we're going to start with the requirements of the plants first, because it's important to understand the plants. What do they require? You're dealing with living uh, organisms now, okay? And then we're going to look at the photosynthesis. Do not be afraid. I don't go too crazy with the photosynthesis. I mean, like, I have eliminated lots of the biochemical reactions and stuff, but sufficient enough for you to understand and to operate this machine correctly, right? And then we're going to have a break uh, in the afternoon when we come back at 2 p.m. We're going to continue with chlorophyll fluorescence. If this is your first time learning fluorescence, not to worry, we're going to understand because Fluorescence is actually not really biology. It's actually a physical phenomenon, right? Do you like physics? <laughs> Usually people in, in, the, in the biology uh, line, they don't really like physics. You know, see all the symbols and equations. Yeah, it seems a bit overwhelming. Right, so um, do get your notes. Uh, you see, it's very special. Your notes, all fully colored. <coughs> right. And for the second day, we're going to learn how to operate the machine. We got two machines. So we're going to have both machine here in this bench here, in this bench here. For that, I will be doing the instruction and you will have officers uh, to assist you with um, how to do the machine setting okay so this machine um, is actually not very new per se but the generation is the latest so this particular uh, portable photosynthesis system uh, was launched in 2006 and since then it has undergone a few facelifts you know pretty much like a car right yeah, you go every every two or three years. The manufacturer will give a new uplift boost um, to the appearance. So the one that we have in our department now, fortunately, that's the full spec, meaning that that's the the highest, the best of the best that you can get, right? So we're going to do that for tomorrow to understand what is the modes of measurement capable being done by this particular machine. We've got the steady state or survey measurements, the response curve measurements, and also the chlorophyll A fluorescence measurements, right? Okay, and we'll, in the afternoon for the second day, we are also going to learn some tips and tricks if your plants are not behaving the way they should or the way you expect. We got three plants, uh, later on you will see, to show you the, the diversity of the measurements that can be done by this machine. Then done with that. Oh, I forgot to mention, at the, at the end of each day, uh, we going, because you're going to get certificate, right? I'm not going to give you a certificate if you don't answer the question. 
Uh, well, welcome back to Kulia Life. <laughs> yeah. Not to worry, you can bring back to home uh, in the, at the end of the first day. Uh, you take back the assessment. It's open Chrome. Ask grandma, ask ancestor, ask everybody who you want to ask. Don't mind. Yeah. Is, is husband not helpful? Go ask neighbors. Right. Right. So we do the same thing for the second day as well. And that actually, you know what, assessment is good. I don't want you to get 100 full marks as well. I just want your brain to make the connection. Okay. So the reason why people do not do this kind of training is because even though they are super skillful in dealing with the machine, doing various stuff with the machine, teaching is another thing, okay? Teaching, you need to understand how the student's brain is working. So that's why we do the assessment. Then finally, for the third day, um, what's this? Yeah, we're going to see. How, uh, you have taken the, all the measurements, right? All the fancy data in the machine. How to extract the data? And then how to understand the data, okay? Because these data, the moment, because this machine is very powerful, the moment you hit lock, you're going to get like not one measurement. You're going to get a minimum 50 different kind of measurements because this thing is filled with sensors, right? So we need to understand which variables or which parameters that you should be interested with depending on your research questions. If your um, hypothesis design in a certain way, which kind of variables that you should be, be focusing on? Right. So that would be happening uh, for the third day. And then we're going to learn the interpretation of it. Right. Remember, negative result is result. Okay. Don't throw any negative result out of the window. Right, because you're dealing with biology now. Just because your photosynthesis reads negative doesn't mean that it's, it's not alive. Negative in, in photosynthesis means respiration. Right. So mathematical or numerical values in one hand, biological reasoning in another hand, bring them together, you've got a beautiful conclusion to be drawn out of it. Right. And for the final session for the third day, that for the consultation. Um, I strongly suggest if you have specific things to address or anything related, uh, give to the committee ahead of time. If you have data or something, you have, you, you have the committee, right? I'm not in your WhatsApp. I don't have WhatsApp. So very traditional, right? Um, if you do not have any question, or maybe only some of you, we'll just discuss how are you doing in your assessment. Yeah, let's, let, let's see who's the scorer. All right, okay, I think that's all for, for the overview for the course. Any question before we start with the first session? Good, good, all right. I got my ma magic wand. Not only Harry Potter got it. Actually, mine, the one I use for my class is even longer. This actually broke, you know? <laughs> okay. So the, we, we're going to look at this um, foundation of plant requirements. You know, plants are living organisms. When you are alive, you must, your existence must be fulfilled. Otherwise, you'll stop from living. Okay? If you look at the stone, the pebbles on the road, they're pretty much there. They can be there for millions of years, you know, since dinosaur time. Nothing happened to it because they don't have any specific requirement. They are existent, just be there. They're going to change, maybe due to the weathering process and so on, but pretty much they don't need specific requirements. But plants, like us, specific requirements must be met to enable the plant to complete its life cycle. In, in the context of agriculture, this is very important because if you think about it, 
agriculture, horticulture is all about harvesting the organs of interest from the plant. Some plants you harvest the leaf, some plants you harvest the fruits or the roots or the stems. Right. So in order for the plants to produce these organs abundantly for your benefit, you need to fulfill its requirement. And we're going to look at what are the requirements. I created this uh, formula a long time ago. Um, don't look up the textbook. This is not in textbook. So I call it this as an allowing formula. Okay. A L W N G. These are air, light, water, nutrient, and growth manner. All of these to allow what exactly? For the plants to grow healthily, for the plants to develop normally, which is very important. If, if the plants do not develop normally, you're not going to get your organs of interest. And since agriculture is business, it's actually for the human livelihood, right? So, once you have fulfilled of this, regardless where you put your plants in, even in the International Space Station, you know, we have one right orbiting our planet, you can grow the plants. So, these are the formula that the NASA people use as well to enable the plants to live in just about anywhere. Gravity is not a requirement, by the way. Right? So, let's see in greater details what are they so air so there are four main components when talking about the air got a humidity oxygen concentration temperature and also um, co2 concentration for the temperature <coughs> temperature is actually the measure of kinetic um, energy or motion of molecules in any given medium right so if you if you can see here um, this jiggly animation that I've got here in the low temperature near zero you can see that the molecule is hardly moving but as you increase the temperature meaning that the energy is getting more and more the molecules got all this energy to vibrate even more vigorously right so if you think about it the the higher the temperature, the faster all these molecules are actually moving. And the molecules are present everywhere. You got the molecules in the air, you got the molecules in solid in here. You can't see the individual molecules like in, in this cartoon here, but they are there. When you subject this um, surface of the bench with an intense heat, the molecules are going to vibrate very, very aggressively to the point they're going to change itself right and this temperature in the context of plant growth it's very important because plants pretty much like us carry out various biochemical reactions and all these reactions are temperature dependent you can see from uh, from the growth uh, curve here when the temperature is rather very low there's not much growth is going on but as the temperature is increasing you get this exponential spur of growth for the plants right but when the temperature is a bit too much it's going to plateau no normal growth so for every plant species depending on whether it's tropical or temperate or maybe in the tundra there's a special optimum temperature for that particular species right so you can see here this is a, a regular grass here you can see that for this particular plant the optimum temperature is about 30 this is actually day and night okay 30 35 and so on so we can make a conclusion even without people telling this plant is actually tropical it loves being in the warmth, right? And surprisingly, temperature also has impact in the soil, right? Think about it. <clears throat> Plants is filled with proteins, right? So, so much protein, just like in you. 
these proteins, when they are in this super high temperature, what will happen? They got the nature, right? An egg, after you have boiled the egg, become a hard boiled egg, can you reverse it to become liquid? Even though I know there is a way, but it takes a lot of energy to reverse it. And very, very unpleasant and people are going to look very wrong at you. It's pretty much irreversible because the protein is now natured, denatured, right? Denatured protein in plants can't be used. The plants need to use extra energy to break them down and then to rebuild it. So this is actually costing the plant and the growth cannot proceed as one would expect. So it's very important, the temperature and the relative humidity. Um, this is actually important if you are dealing with plants grow in the confined environment or controlled environment. The moment you see the word relative, you know that it's, it's, it is comparing it to something. But it's comparing to what? You see, for any given volume on our planet, let's say that this um, room, this room here, this lab here, the volume uh, fillable with any liquid is 1,000 liter, right? So when this room is a, being a, is able to be filled with 1,000 liter, that's the maximum capacity. But when you do the measurement, perhaps you use a hygrometer. When you do the measurement, you only detect there's only 500 liters of water vapor in this room. So the room capacity is 1,000 liter. What you measure using equipment is only 500 liter. You see, there's a benchmark. This is the uh, instantaneous measurement. So that means this room relative humidity is said to be 50%. Right. So do you want a high humidity or low humidity? That actually a sweet spot for any temperature that you deal with. So there's a little chart here. So this chart tells you that if your temperature, let's say that our temperature, what's our temperature in our region? 30 perhaps. So for the 30 degree region, you would need your relative humidity or your region to be from this 6.4 to 10.6. What happened if you got more? The amount of water. It's not going to do your plants any good. Okay. Do you know the sauna room? Have you ever been into the sauna room? <laughs> if you are too long in the sauna room with all the steam hitting your face, it's very hard to breathe actually. Right. So that's, that, that's what's happening to the plant. It's hard to breathe and eventually all this extra moisture will cause the plant to have mold overgrowth on it, right? So we do not want that. So 1,000 liter capacity in UPM Serdang versus 1,000 liter capacity in Camera Highland, they are going to be able to hold water differently, okay? As you can see here, the altitude has impact on it. Okay. When it's warmer, near the ground, you can hold more water vapor. But if you go up, you're going to be able to hold much less water vapor. Right. And then oxygen concentration. Okay, this, this is, um, it goes without saying, you live in organism, everybody needs um, oxygen. And the thing I would like to highlight here, it's not used by the photosynthetic organelle in plants, but rather being used by the mitochondria. Right. This is the, the guy that uses all the oxygen. Okay. Remember, okay, plants, even though oxygen you always regard as the plant's product, plants use its own oxygen. Right. But it doesn't use that much. There's always excess to share with the rest of the planet. Think about it. The plants can live without you, all of you human. But can human live without plants?
can it? Can it happen? Uh, oh, I can. I, I got my scuba tank going on. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> right. And CO2 concentration in the air. This is very important because this is one of the primary ingredients to run photosynthesis. This is the substrate use of photosynthesis. All the sugars that you have in your food all actually originated from CO2 in the air. It was once floating about in the air in the form of gaseous and now it's in the form of sugar that you can enjoy very sweetly. Right, so that is all chemical reaction taking place. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Plants, they have the genetic and uh, molecular components to do that. Right. The second component is light. Okay, I need to control myself when it comes to light because um, um, this is the physics thing I was talking about earlier. And it can be very scary up to this point i don't i don't find people that can actually um remember or connect the dots all the lights lessons that i've given i do not understand why but for orang putih the moment I, I taught them they kind of remember it i do not know maybe they consume more omega-3 or something <laughs> so, <laughs> so light the second thing also ingredient for photosynthesis not ingredient per se but um, something to energize for the process to happen. You need to see light now, not in the sense of it just shines my life, it illuminates my present. You need to regard life now as a science approach, is as an entity. Okay, light even though with all the advancement in technology now, is still regarded as an enigmatic entity, a mysterious entity. Why? Because light has dual nature. Okay? It can be present as wave, it can be present as a particle, all at the same time. So the duality nature of light make it somewhat uncertain whether to talk like in certain specific way or should we kind of oh, depending on your context we talk about light in the sense of energy today tomorrow we talk in the sense of uh, particles okay so um, this duality nature kind of utilized by the plants to do photosynthesis. Plants actually know this light that coming towards it has this duality nature. So plants utilize this, right? And the third dimension of light that you know is photophilia. Photophilia is simply the how long the light is going on. Okay. <clears throat> so light quantity, light quality, and light duration. It's very, very important to understand this. You, I, I, I've, I started give give lecture about light since so seven years ago. People kind of, oh, what is this? You know, I mean, the agriculture people, not the physics people. Physics people, they, this is their snack. They kind of find it it's very alien concept because they, they regard light, sunshine as, you know, something the, the plants need just to make it the photosynthesis happened but there is more to it actually so light quantity is dealing with the um, how many light particles are present for a given area meaning that as the intensity becomes higher the particles of the light become denser okay and this machine can actually count how many light particles are there. Light particles are called photons. I forgot to mention. You see, these are people who are afraid getting screamed at. Where's the marker? Where's the marker? So light particle equals to photon. Not for proton, okay? 
Proton is the car that you see in the news, something fire and smoke coming out from the back. Not that. Photon, photon, light, particle, zarah, cahaya. This, the second thing is the quality. So, quality is about the color. Okay. Look at this line. It's coming towards you, right? Actually, what's coming to you are in the form of packets of energy. And in this cartoon, it's being depicted as small bits. This is white, meaning that it's a collection of the rainbow color, correct? So there are many packets of energy or bits of color actually being shown upon you. There are blue bits, red bits, yellow bits, purple bits, orange bits, all sort of bits coming towards you. So these bits, each of them has its own energy. Okay, and that is called quantum. Did your heartbeat skip a bit? <laughs> Hearing this word? Quantum, packet of energy. And this energy can be translated in numerical value in the form of lambda or wavelength. You know, right, wavelength, usually the unit that we use is nanometer. In case you have forgotten, the wavelength, have you seen the wavelength? So, this is one complete cycle, right? So, um, this wavelength, it comes with a number, 400 nanometer, for example, 700 nanometer, for example. This numerical value actually represents the energy inside of it. One ruling is very important. The higher, the higher the wavelength, meaning that the longer the wavelength, the lower of the energy. The shorter the wavelength, the higher is the energy. And this is the rule. Please remember that. Okay? And it's actually, uh, I have depicted here actually. You can see that the blue color here got the less wave, right? But look at the voltage there. 3.1 electron volt. 400 nanometer is actually blue. For the red, it's actually 700 nanometer. You see the red? There are much more wavelength coming, but the electron volt only 1.7. This is actually to prove this law. It goes opposite. Longer wavelength, low energy. Shorter wavelength, higher energy. So why 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 does it important? So this nanometer is translated to color. This is blue. This is red. And this is something that our eyes can perceive. Okay, and this is the reason we can see, we can read, you can argue with your neighbors, and so on. What happens if the wavelength is before this or after this? For our eyes, we can't see it. So I got, I got a little uh, depiction here. So that's, that's your eye, eyeball, right? Do you have eyeball? Which one is your eyeball? The top one or the bottom one? Top. Top. Anybody got the bottom one eyeball? That's insects. Are you lipas? <laughs> insects, young fly, salonya uh, lipas. Hey, uh, no, don't be surprised. I, a cockroach can fly. Uh, the when it's crawling, creeping, you call it lipas. The moment it's flying, you don't call it lipas anymore. You call something else. 
<laughs> dia kalau orang takut super takut tu dia tahu lah apa uh, terus keluar <laughs> lipas terbang lipas terbang uh, including including the fly the uh, lalat as well okay this this thing here um, the whole this we call it the light spectrum it's from the heaven not heaven janatul firdausi tu bukan from the sun we call it this as a full spectrum cosmic ray so our sun lots of chemical reaction going on uh, nuclear fusion and so on it will emit high amount of energy coming from it and this energy is a full spectrum of light light in the range that you can see as well as the range that you can't see at all so it's starting from the 0 0.1 nanometer all the way to infinity nanometer the part that we can see is very small it's actually between 400 nanometer and 700 nanometer that's why i used this example earlier and these are the only colors that our eyes can perceive you you know at the back of our eyes your eyeball at the back what is it bone at the back of your eye there's, there's a retina these retina are embedded with specialized photoreceptor cells called cone cells and road cells cone cells are the cells that can perceive the rgb color okay so these make you only able to perceive this because that's the way the god has created you of course there are some mutations among human but that's very rare you can know if your people got mutation your friend got mutation if you ask the color of the sky you, are, you ask uh, color of the sky from your friend and then your friend answer is violet okay the moment your friends say the sky is violet you know it's got mutation in this eye right they they they, they can see be uh, before 400 as well because our sky is actually blue is not the abundant color the abundant color is actually the, the violet region, the UV region. The reason we see blue because that's all we can see with our limited photoreceptor ability. Right. So why this color is important is because of the effects that it has on the phenotype of the plants. You see, when it's completely blue, the plants are able to flower. Right. But it has less um, leafy veg vegetation, vegetative part to it. When it's full spectrum, you kind of got flower and you got the uh, leafy part as well. But when it's completely red, you don't have flower almost at all. Right. So if you were to have the industry of floriculture, isn't this information useful? It's very useful. Right. Because sometimes, maybe you want to grow your uh, vegetable because that's leaf is your organ of interest. Why waste money and have all this fancy blue light? Blue light is very expensive, you know. Only use the red light, right? But if you are interested with the flower, give more blue light, right? If you just want to feel good about yourself, a useful spectrum, right? Okay, and then intensity. This is stuff I was talking about the light uh, quantity all this this is light coming down as packet of energy and these are called quantum in this depiction here in the form of beads it's actually not beads it's just a depiction to make people understand better it's coming from you and this can be measured how many photons per unit area per second and this machine can do you see this little red thing here i can open this this is actually light sensor. This guy can me measure the PPFD, photosynthetic photon flux density. Right? So, PPF, photosynthetic photon flux, meaning that the photons only have the energy between 400 to 700. Hence the word photosynthesis. Don't you find it? It's a very interesting coincidence. The light that energized photosynthesis the energy 
coincide with the light your retina can perceive. It's very interesting. Because the plant also utilizes between 400 and 700. Your photoreceptor only receptive to 400 to 700. There's uh, overlapping features there between humans and plants. It's very important, very interesting. Okay. There are many, actually, many more, many more things uh, we overlap with plants. Right. And these are important to do the photosynthesis. Uh, later on, you're going to learn in the light reactions. Okay. So that's why it's very important when you are dealing, especially with the indoor lighting, light source distance from your plants have impact in terms of the quantity. You see, when the, this is inches here, when it's six inches, you got about almost 2000 micromoles of light. But when it's much farther, you only got like, what? A fifth of that amount or a sixth of that amount, right? So, if you are being smart about this, you don't have to change the light, but change the height of your light as the plants get older, right? And that's going to be very helpful in the production for the plants, right? Uh, this is actually the slide before I just make it bigger so that you can see. Uh, the PPF and also the PPFD. Micro mole. The fact that it's called mole, you should know. You know mole? Not mole, the animal that borrowing. Or the traitor in your company. Not that kind of mole. What's a mole? Any, anybody want, want to tell? What, what's a mole? Siapa tak pernah tak pernah tahu mol M O L bukan M O I mol itu bubok. Oh semua orang tahu lah mol. Wah semua. Honest, I just want to honest. Sebenarnya ingat tak mol ni apa? Oh okay okay. Memang kimia betul. Masa kat sekolah belajar waktu kimia. Syllabus form four tu. You you can say that <coughs> I like to do this menanya. Um Okay. Very quickly, very quickly. When I say the number you you tell me when I say the number pula. Eh, bukan apa betul lah. When I say the number, you tell me what words coming to your mind. Don't answer it with number. If if I say solo. One. One. If I say twin. Two. Two. If I say... Five. If I say dozen. Twelve. Twelve. If I say... Abad or century? Ten. Ten lah, hundred lah. Macam tu. <laughs> century! Hundred. If I say alaf, macam mana macam alaf baru? Thousand. Thousand. If I say more? Uh, six point oh two times ten to the power of twenty-three. Banyak lah Enam Ni kalau nak jadikan bahasa dia lah Enam Trilion Trilion Bilion Ni dua belas Ini sembilan Dua belas campur sembilan berapa? <laughs> dua puluh satu Dua puluh satu Hundred Six Trilion Bilion Hundred Banyak tak? Banyak lah. Siapa banyak? Ini banyak ke? Yo dosa. <laughs> dosa kau yang tak tahu buat lagi. <laughs> 6 trilion bilion ratus. Banyak lah sebab dia 10 kuasa 23. Banyak tu. Jadi bayangkan, this machine can actually detect it. Do you understand kenapa dia mahal sekarang? 
Uh, itulah bilangan zarah cahaya. The number of light particles or photons per given area that this machine will tell you when you're doing the measurement. Right? Okay. Right. And for today, this is simply about the the uh, the length of the light. Okay. And in Malaysia, mostly plants are what we call as day neutral, meaning that it doesn't care whether the night is long or the uh, day is longer. They go into flower when the time comes. Okay. You know, if you go to Camera Highland, you can see that uh, they are turning on this incandescent light hanging. Have you seen it? Kau tak nak pergi Camera Highland? Kau pergi, kau, kau pergi London terus. These these people they they selling the chrysanthemums. You see, chrysanthemums is a short day plant, meaning that as as long as the the day length more than twelve hours a day, they're not going to flower. So the producer, horticultural for producer in Kamara Highland, when they don't have any orders, they turn on the light. Uh, the whole night, the whole night, maybe like eighteen hours a day to suppress flowering from happening but maybe next week there is a landslide lots of funeral to cater we got lots of order they stop the light the plants flowering uh, so it's bad for the funeral people but good for the ama doing the uh, crescent business right so this little trick can surprisingly create lots of money in, in, in certain industry Right. Okay. Uh, but most plants actually in, in tropical, they don't care about this. <clears throat> right. And then water. Okay. We got oxygen again. At temperature, pH and EC. Oxygen. Right. I, I, I want to highlight it, especially later on if you are working with aquatic plants or, you know, rice, for example. You see, even though in the pond, you know, pond, kolam, tasik, there is always this layer, aerobic layer and anaerobic layer. In a completely submerged soil, as in, in the pond, you still get this aerobic soil. Aerobic means that there is a presence of oxygen in the particular layer of the soil. This is why the microbes can flourish even in the completely you see that oh i cannot live there you can't live but the microbes are very happy in that because there's a, always a small layer of aerobic layer so and for anaerobic of course there's a lot more because this is a stagnant water but if you go to the regular terrestrial uh, area like this um, peanut you have abundance of aerobic layer and then only your anaerobic layer Right, so this is important because the plants, of course, require the water for the photosynthesis as well as for the transpiration. Right, and temperature. Water temperature is very important because whatever the plants absorb, it absorb the quality of the water as well. If the water is heated, yeah, the plant is not going to be very happy about it. It's going to have all these impacts on the plant it's going to cause the stress then the ethylene the stress hormones start to get released the cells development will be highly impaired the stomata are going to close and then the leaf eventually got chlorosis and so on right so that's why more and more people now are practicing cool water irrigation right so you can see in this little experiment here the root zone or the, the chilled water experiment you can see that the moment the water gets around the 25 degree, that's where you get the happiest ever plant. Not too cold, not too hot. If it's too cold, you, you see, the, the cooler the water gets, it becomes denser. Did you know that? Until 4 degree. So the denser water is actually kind of hard to go up. Yeah, not to mention all the resistances and, and so on. But if it's too hot, it's going to cause all the physiological problems. 25 degree, good to go. Right. And then pH. pH, it stands for hydrogen potential. 
these highly relate to two things. Number one is the nutrient uptake. Plants roots, the root of the plant, in the soil. Okay, and the soil have all of these um, ions plot in in its particle, the soil particle, right? So when the pH is too acidic or too alkaline, basic, the release of these ions or elements are going to be hampered. So we can see that when the soil is too acidic, much of the macronutrients are going to be unavailable, such as N, P, K, and also sulfur. Right. When it's too alkaline or basic, you're going to get the macronutrients such as uh, boron uh, and copper zinc to be unavailable. But if you go slightly near neutral, not completely neutral, near neutral between 5.5 to 6.5, that's actually the win-win situation for the plants. Right, and the pH also have impact on the microbes that lives um, in the in the soil. Okay, it's because the microbes, like the plants, living organism, when it's too acidic, only certain population of microbes are there, rather than when it's too alkaline. Okay, is it not possible to make it just neutral? <clears throat> is it possible to have neutral soil or neutral water? What's your uh, blood pH? Do we have blood? Yes. Are you are you the eyeball up or down? <laughs> <laughs> your blood pH is about seven point two to seven point three, so it's slightly um, alkaline, just a slight, very near. When something is neutral seven, it's actually very welcoming to dissolving anything you know water you get from the machine pH 7 the moment you put on the table immediately the pH will drop because CO2 will dissolve in it right so that's why without regulation a standalone water cannot maintain 7 pH something from the environment will change its pH your blood however 7.2 that's pretty much consistent because your body got the homeostasis process right when you are a bit acidic the the, the body will release the bicarbonate when you are too alkaline then the, the acidity will be increasing your body okay so now ask yourself if you uh, see people drinking alkaline water is it going to work <laughs> yeah that's that's a high high very highly debated Right, and then the other one is electrical conductivity. So in the water, the nutrients will be dissolved. When they are dissolved, they are no longer in the elemental form. They are in the ionic form. And this ionic form will cause electrical conductivity. And this is the unit here, microsiemens per centimeter, or the um, micro mole per centimeter. It's actually the reciprocal of each other. Conductivity and resistivity. Right? Remember, you learn from your school time, kemarahan hidup. Apa zaman sekarang tak ada kemarahan hidup? You learn about ohm, resistor, and then uh, how, how to read all the values and so on. When you have high salt dissolved in the water, you're going to get high electrical conductivity. This EC here. So the plants are going to be happy because lots of nutrients. But when the EC is increasing, meaning that lots of salts are dissolved, it's, it won't be doing the plants any good. Okay? Because remember of, uh, osmosis when the concentration of the water becoming lesser and lesser the system in in the water actually will give up its own water uh, to the solution right so one one thing uh, in hydroponic industry people use this all the time but one warning it doesn't tell you what nutrient is more what nutrient is less it just give you okay this is the reading 1.8 uh, microsiemens 
but it doesn't tell you whether the nitrogen is depleted or the potassium is depleted right that you still need to send to the lab but for a quick check because you know the uptake is rather homogeneous for your plant and that's fine to use this EC meter right and then the fourth component is the nutrients involving composition purity and microbes right uh, let's see composition you know periodic tables of elements oh kimia lagi dia ni cikgu kimia ke how many elements are there Ooh. I should make like a quiz for my class kan bawa bawa tu bawa hadiah siapa dapat nah, nah coklat how many elements are there come on come on 15 uh, sure open chrome open chrome open mozilla don't open shirt only other thing is open one one no. one one eight one one eight but not elements are found naturally in the earth some elements are only available achievable in the lab especially the the towards the end because it requires so much energy to create that element from these one one eight elements not all are required by the plants to complete its happy life cycle how many needed by the plants actually out of these 118 elements I would like to say there is a mazhab for this uh, whether you are uh, this, the, the, the play safe mazhab or you are rebellious mazhab or you are on the fence mazhab if you if you are the orthodox mazhab you will say 16 if you are the rebellious and go for the movement revolution revolution you say 18 and since what we are in UPM, we stay on the fence. We go 17. <laughs> okay. So 17. And these are the elements. We got the non-mineral, the uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Then we got the primary or macronutrient, MPK, calcium, magnesium, um, and sulfur. And then micronutrient, boron, chl chlor chlorine, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum. SI is actually kind of uh, some people regard it, some re not regard it, sodium and zinc, right? So, what happened to the 18 one? They include vanadium. You know vanadium? Right? So, they include vanadium, that's why it's 18. But, um, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, the framework element, the nominal CHO, and also the primary and secondary macro, regardless of the species, they always need it. But for the micronutrients, that's where the discrepancies come in. Some plants need more, some plants do not need at all. You know, peanut? Peanut requires molybdenum and nickel to, to make the peanuts to happen. But if you give um, nickel to the uh, rice, the rice is not going to be so happy. Right. It's, it's actually kind of toxic to, to the plants, the nickel. Right. Okay. And the purity, uh, this is important if you are working, especially in tissue culture, you want to achieve certain percentage or weightage of the element, but your element never comes in pure form of it. Okay. We're not talking about gold, you know, your 9999 gold, but it comes in the form of compound so it's very important to recalculate this so that you get the element and also take into account the friend in the compound of element right you know um, sodium and then you know chlorine in the nature form what 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 is the state of this chlorine in the form of gas sodium in the form of solid sodium cube if you slice and you throw it in water it's going to boom hiroshima again it's very super reactive chlorine you open the jar you're going to see amount very soon you turn blue first of course but sodium 
and chlorine, when they are combined together, you got your table salt. And if you put it in your in your cooking, and then the whole family happy. <laughs> you see, you see, you see the, the, the context here. When they are alone, they're doing no good. But when they are brought together, they're very beneficial. Right. So it's it's the magic of chemistry. Right. And then microbes. Okay. These are if you're an agriculture student, please, please, please remember this. When you fertilize the land, I know the the our land for agriculture is highly utilized, heavily dependent on when you fertilize um, ladang land or anything, uh, the medium. You are actually not only feeding the plants or your crops. You are actually feeding this whole microbes community, right? So one of the good approach to formulate the fertilizer is actually to pay some attention to what will make the microbes as happy as well because when you are only focusing on mpk 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 there's a clear imbalance there when the microbes are happy will the plant really be happy you, you may get the plant to be happy for one season, but for the next season, you're not going to get the same yield, right? It's pretty much like a yeah, human, right? You, 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 you are taking all this fiber and probiotics, you know, to keep your gut healthy. You know, the, the vitagen uh, iklan, macam mana dia buat tangan tu? I, I, sampai sekarang tak lagi buat. Macam mana? You know, kan kau tak tahu aku cakap iklan apa ni? <laughs> you know iklan yang dia buat, uh, uh, sayangi perut anda. <laughs> Why? If your own microbes in your gut is thrown out of balance, completely next morning you lau lau say. Confirm. Kau tahu lau say apa? Cakap kau lau say apa? Diarrhea lah. Diarrhea lah. Kata kata satu Malaysia ke stok gentur tak ada sekarang. <laughs> stok satu Malaysia tak ada. You need. Kalau tak, all these people using all this language, kau tak faham sebenarnya mengata kau. Alright, okay. You see, this is why I shouldn't be talking in Malay. Sebab my vocabulary Malay is very huge. Kau tahu aku akan cakap Malay repeat. Uh, so, we, we, we speak in English because it's more elegant that way. Right. Right. And finally, it's the growth manner. Also important in terms of agriculture. Let, let's see. Plants have roots, right? The roots have to anchor in something. And that something, in nature, it's soil. But with the modern technology now, it doesn't have to be soil. It can be substrate. And the substrate can be anything non-soil. Rock, wool, lake, coir, perlite, cocoa peat, and so on. So, for the soil, I, I, I suggest if you have trouble with your plants, if you, if you are still growing in plants, uh, in, in the land, understand the um, soil, this soil triangle. Because sometimes, the plants are not doing well because it's in the wrong soil. You see? For example, if you grow a coconut in this silk clay, it's not going to be very happy actually. But in the sickly, if you grow rice, it's going to be very happy. Right. So, certain soil is suitable for certain plant. Not only because of the nutrient availability of the soil, but the texture of the soil because the roots is happy in that texture. And that facilitates all this uh, cation exchange. Right. So, it's very important. So, that's why I put growth manner, soil, or substrate is very important and finally is the spacing um, is there any spacing in the forest jungle okay. yes in a way naturally but it kind of happened accidentally not purposely have the spacing right. do you know this Shy, shy crown, crown shyness, crown shyness. 
so the plants actually when they can't coexist they have various ways to ensure that the competition is eliminated for example using allelopathy and so on so i know in agriculture you want to get the most out of your crop harvest but sometimes when the plants are too close or not enough spacing you see this fr and red it's the far red and red line a right spacing can tremendously increase your harvest right so because red and far red is the light that caused the growth of the plants to spur so pay attention to the spacing even though you are doing your your hydroponic at home okay spacing is very important all right yay yay baru satu baru satu okay um that's for the um the first session right any question anota can can you it's okay so they will get for you all right any question not any question you can go for objection with me silakan you know you don't have to agree with 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 people all the time you know if you agree that means you kau berpura-pura lah hidup <laughs> Okay. All right. So that's the fundamental foundation of plants um, requirement. Okay. Uh, so ten up. So we can take a fifteen minute breaks. If you got question, you can ask. Uh, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Any question? All good. If you are too shy, you can write surat layang and then send to friends. <laughs> surat layang is accepted form of asking question. <laughs> 